Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Thanks you all for attending. Uh, those here and online. Uh, we'll start with Wolf. All right. Allison Welch. On. I am sorry. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Can you hit the mute button? So yeah. Good morning. Thanks, Allison. Ariel Tarango. Or Solfus. Present. Candace Williams. Present. Carrie Lewis. Present. Corey Usher. Dale Woolridge. Edward Nick. Present. Thank you. Uh, Garth Gamer. Just reached. Just now logged on. Okay. Heather Miller. Present. Josh Gaither. Present. Julie Augenstein. Laura Smith. Present. Maria Salas. Present. Michelle Guadnola. Paul Dabrowski. Ralph Kelly. Ray Proa. Present. Sean Bowker. Tiffany Strever. And Tom Flanagan. Shelly, this is Garth Gamer. I, I think I missed my roll call, but I'm present. Thank you, Dr. Gamer. I count 11, I need 13. Um, we can proceed with an informational meeting. <clears throat> Dr. Woolridge doesn't be here in about 20 minutes, so that may, may help. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead with our informational one. We'll start with the chairman's report. Um, take a look at the attendance report. Uh, that's the that's a nice sheet in your packet here. Uh, we do encourage everybody to attend and make it uh, virtually. Um, uh, we do uh, want people to be here, so please uh, participate in the around. Um, <clears throat> I want to draw your attention to a few vacancies. The first one, state designated level four trauma center program manager. If you or your friends are level four trauma program managers, uh, have them reach out to Shelly if they're interested. Law enforcement representative with involvement in EMS, again, reach out to Shelly if you have any law enforcement colleagues. Uh, Pre-hospital coordinator for SAMES, we've had uh, some significant turnover there. Contact uh, Sarah Parati if anyone on the call is interested in that position. And then an EMS council liaison uh, to be filled by any current EMS council member. Uh, Shelby, do we need to do that in business or? Oh, that's good. Yeah. And then uh, Dr. Woolworth, if you could join, he can pull people into that trouble. He just joined. Oh, he did. All right. So We've then. got uh, also Michelle Gladden also, and now we have. Great. Thank you. All right. So, with oh, that. I'll turn it over for our brief presentation. Melissa Luxon, are you on the call? Good morning. Yes, I'm here. Do you want to present your screen? Alrighty. Can you see that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Melissa Luxton. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the Trauma Outreach and Injury Prevention Coordinator at Banner University Medical Senior Center Phoenix. And I am also the chairperson of the Arizona Falls Prevention Coalition. So I've been asked to just present a quick presentation um, under 10 minutes this morning. Uh, discussing the Arizona Falls Prevention Coalition and how we can strengthen our relationships with our EMS partners. Uh, many of you have probably heard me present over uh, the past few months. This one's a little bit different. Um, I have some exciting news to share from the coalition, so just going to be real quick. Um, first of all, I just kind of want to talk about who the AFPC is. So the AFPC is it was a grassroots effort, um, was designed to provide information, advice, helpful hints, and tips to help prevent falls and fall injuries um, by the elderly in the state of Arizona. Um, we actually have several different chapters. So we have our Western, our Northern, and our Southern chapter, as well as 
our main chapter that's housed here in Maricopa County. So it is a statewide outreach effort. Uh, we promote evidence-based falls prevention approaches and coordinate existing efforts, providing technical assistance and increasing opportunities for older adults to enhance their quality of life. Um, how we do that is we provide education and information to help those adults um, improve their flexibility, balance, reduce their fear of falling, and overall decrease the likelihood of, the, of a fall. Um, we also do a lot of advocacy throughout the state and um, help promote good, healthy behaviors. So like I said, we do have a statewide impact. Um, we've held professional and public education awareness events. We've also done professional and public symposiums, which we are looking to bring back uh, hopefully by next year. Uh, we are engaged with fire and medical departments, help many of the different health systems throughout the state, local health departments, county health departments, and then um, several higher education institutions, including ASU, uh, GCU, U of A, um, and NAU. Just want to really quick talk about the burden of falls. So they are very, very common. Um, the consequences can be very serious and they are, in, as far as unintentional injuries go, they're the seventh leading cause of death among our older adults. In fact, one in four older adults will fall this year. And that's widely underreported because many people that fall do not tell their primary care doctor or even a family member because they're embarrassed. And it is the uh, number one cause of un unintentional injury deaths among our older adults. This is just taken from the CDC, so you can see right there, seventh leading cause of death overall, just under diabetes, which is huge. And then as far as unintentional injury deaths falls, is always number one. Every second an older adult falls, so this, again, national statistic, you can see here 36 million falls a year, 8 million injuries, 3 million ED visits. And those of you that are involved in EMS, I'm sure you can relate to the uh, outrageous amount of fall calls and lift assist calls you get on a daily basis. As I said, the consequences can be serious. More than 95% of hip fractures in older adults are due to falls, and our hip fractures uh, have a high one-year mortality rate. They often lead to loss of independence and nursing home placement. So our independent livers that are able to take care of themselves and perform all their ADLs often find themselves in nursing home placement with their quality of life drastically reduced after the fall. And these fall death rates are on the rise even after adjusting for the aging population. So sometimes when you look at statistics, it may seem like they're they're going down, but if you look at it in adjustment to the, the rising aging population, they're actually increasing. They cost our healthcare system uh, lots of money. So $29 billion in Medicare funds every year, $9 billion in Medicaid, and $12 billion out of pocket. So $50 billion overall every year. In our state alone, um, I just kind of mapped the trends out since 2016. And you can see during COVID, they kind of took a dip. People weren't going out as much, staying home, and then they're on the rise. And we're on the rise again for 2022 and on par to be even higher in 2023. So it's, it's a a problem that's not going away. Um, just to kind of break down the demographics a little bit here, in our state, American Indians have the highest rate of falls related mortality amongst all ages. And then when we look at male versus female, um, our our highest uh, was 85 year old, 85 year olds in both categories, females being more likely due to osteoporosis. Um, for those of you that don't haven't used the 911 dashboard, this is a great resource that I always like to talk about. If anybody doesn't know, you can actually go on the state website. I have the link posted here and I'm happy to share it in the chat box where you can go and see the region and you can actually look at the current weekly 911 call volumes. And this doesn't change. This looks like this week after week after week. Um, falls is by long and far the most, the most calls that they get. Um, and if you look at this right here, um, 61.8 of 911 calls are related to falls, and then falls make up 47.63% of all trauma cases statewide. And that's according to the Arizona State um, Trauma Registry. I can say in my center, um, every year falls are our number one injury um, by long and far. And that's, that's a national trend in discussions with other trauma centers. So some of our risk factors that we have um, for our older adults is neurological conditions, depression, arthritis, osteoporosis, um, any cardiac conditions, diabetes, urinary incontinence. And then 
Some of the modifiable ones are their gait and balance, lower extremity weakness, polypharmacy is a big one, vitamin D deficiency, orthostatic hypotension, visual impairment, foot issues or improper footwear and home hazards. And those are all things that we can that we can change and we can educate on and hopefully reduce that risk for falls. Um, lots of medications, lots of polypharmacy going on. Um, and then really, again, just educating. So medications like anticonvulsants, antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzos, opioids, sedatives, um, even anticholinergics, they dry you out, they can make you dehydrated, same thing with antihistamines, any blood pressure medication causing it to drop too low, could cause dizziness or orthostatic hypotension and muscle relaxants. Many people don't think about those, um, but they do actually impair a person. So they are highly linked to falls. And how our EMS partners can help us with this is really getting a good medication background. So um, oftentimes at the bedside, we'll, our nursing staff will have people you know, pay, come in and those patients are very poor historians and we're not able to identify their medications because they've never been at our center before. Um, they didn't bring their meds with them. And so strengthening that relationship and that communication of identifying those medications between our EMS and our nursing staff would help to identify issues like polypharmacy or identifying medications that could increase them for a fall risk. I um, just want to talk a little bit about the importance of fall prevention education. So um, as I said, every year, millions of people fall. Um, and many of those falls don't cause injuries, but one out of five falls does cause a serious injury, such as a broken bone or a head injury. And it can make that hard for that person to get around or do, any, um, do their ADLs, um, even living on their own. So fall prevention and education in conjunction with fall present prevention strategies such as home modification, vitamin D replacement, bone health supplementation, um, annual eye exams, all of those types of things um, provide numerous advantages such as improving fall prevention awareness, the perception of fall prevention intervention, and self-efficacy. Um, oftentimes people fall just based on the feel of fear of falling. So if they fall in once, they're more likely to fall again solely based on the fear of falling alone. Um, back in 2021, uh, the coalition did a lot of advocacy work to help pass this bill. It's called Senate Bill 1373. It was through the Attorney General's Health and Safety Committee that this bill is passed, and it requires senior care facilities to provide CPR first aid and aid to people who have fallen until EMS arrives on scene. So um, basically, that says that they have to have specialized training for staff. And they have to be trained in not only fall prevention, but also lip assist recovery. And the AFPC was specifically named in the Senate bill and ARS as a, a place, a resource that the healthcare institutions can use for information and training materials from our, from our coalition. And I am very excited to announce that our fall prevention training program is actually launching today in about 30 minutes. We have our general session meeting, so I'm just gonna take you to the webpage here. Um, this is our training program. It's offered absolutely free of charge, and um, this will be a credible source for any of these assisted care facilities or licensed care facilities to get fall prevention training and falls recovery training. They just go here, they click uh, register for an account, they hit get started and then it takes them to a lesson and an assessment quiz. And then the lesson, I'm just gonna show you a brief, a brief um, intro here. <clears throat> so just a video and they can't skip through it. We've taken that feature away. So they actually have to watch the full training course um, to be, and then also going back, then once that video is done, they'll take the assessment quiz. And then it actually spits out a certificate that gives them showing them that they've completed the training. And um, we also have those on record. So if the state wanted to verify, you know, if a center said that they had training, they have put their staff through it, the state can come to us and we can provide them with any, any training certificates as we'll, we will have those on file. So able to cross check that. Um, how to get involved. You can join the coalition. Our website is azstopfalls.org. Like I said, we have many different fire departments and EMS agencies that are part of the coalition. We love to have more. Um, this is our webpage. To apply for membership, you can just visit azstopfalls.org. On the main page here, you can apply for membership by just clicking there. 
and read through everything here. If you don't want to become a member, but you want to utilize the resources, absolutely visit our page. Um, we have all kinds of um, events that are listed, anything falls prevention throughout the state, as well as education that you can use, social media toolkits, video series, and then our training will also be offered on our website as well. There'll be a link to that. Um, statistics, if you're looking for a fast place to grab AZ statistics, we update these on the regular um, so that it's a one-stop shop for all things fall prevention in the state. And I will conclude it because I know you have a very busy meeting this morning and I tried so hard to stay around 10 minutes and I'll take any questions real quick. Thank you, Melissa, for the presentation. Any questions or comments? Uh, Dr. Grant, thank you. You have a question? Uh, Melissa, thanks for that presentation. This has been uh, a project, a thing that I've been kind of eyeballing for quite some time, and I'm glad that someone's doing awesome work with it. I guess my question, um, what was your process about getting uh, funding to help kind of uh, move forward with the project? Because I know many times in the past, hospitals have a hard time uh, being able to help out because quote unquote, they actually lose revenue through this, but there's no doubt that this is the right and important thing to do for patients. I really appreciate it. Um, so as a level one trauma center, uh, certified, verified by the American College of Surgeons, it's a requirement for level one facilities to have a um, injury prevention and trauma outreach program. And it needs to be a robust one. And specifically, it needs to tackle at least the top two injuries um, at BUMCP, we actually have 12 injury prevention programs that um, educate from falls prevention, motor vehicle crashes, that's our, that's our top two. Um, but we educate on interpersonal violence, domestic violence, um, I mean, just so much, railroad safety, we do all kinds of injury prevention, but it's actually a requirement by the ACS. And even our lower, lower leveled centers, they don't have to have a me. Um, they can use their trauma program manager, but they also have to participate in injury prevention, um, education, and outreach in the community. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate it again. Yeah. And I am seeing the comments and I will post the addresses as well as my email address for anybody that wants to reach out to me, um, you know, after afterwards, feel free to email me. Great. Thank you so much again. Appreciate the time and information. Um, let's move on to our bureau report. Uh, Chief All right. Well, good morning, Dr. Gaither and Tepe Committee. Um, I will just briefly share, as you all know, that we are in the middle of legislative session. And so, as always, if there are any questions, um, the Bureau of EMS and Trauma remains ready and available to answer any questions that come up during legislative session with some of the bills that are being run. Um, we are also at, at the department reviewing our rules. Um, I think you all know that we do five-year rule reviews regularly, and so we've looked at a number of our rule sets, and we are on an ongoing basis um, looking at meeting with stakeholders on ambulance rules. We are also looking at our trauma rules currently and um, looking to make some administrative clarifications moving forward with those. Nothing major, really just minor administrative clarifications. We will, of course, keep stakeholders updated on any legislative or rule updates as we move forward. And we have a number of items listed under the Bureau report to cover today to keep you all, again, updated on what the Bureau is working on. I would like to introduce some new Bureau staff before we kick off with the rest of our report. We have with us in the room this morning, Jim Archer, who has joined the Bureau. Are you four weeks in yet? Think so. About four weeks in, Jim. Welcome. We Thank also you. have Sebastian Thomas, who's been with us just a little bit longer. Um, and Jim is joining us as an enforcement investigator, and Sebastian is going to be helping to oversee our first responders opioid grant project. And thank you. Welcome to both of you. We appreciate it. Um, I also want to make sure I embarrass Julia Vinton and um, congratulate her. She has recently accepted an, a promotion as our services section chief within the Bureau. So um, thank you all. We appreciate you joining us for today's meeting and we look forward to continuing to work with you and the rest of the committee. I will pass it next to Dr. Bradley and our opioid prevention team. Good morning, can you guys hear me okay? 
Excellent. All right. Uh, so just wanted to touch base, as uh, was mentioned previously, we do have Sebastian as part of our team, which is really exciting as we get ready to go live with our kind of upgraded naloxone leave behind program. Uh, we were very fortunate to be awarded another four year grant with the FR Cura uh, National Grant System as, uh, under SAMHSA. And with this program, we are in the finalization stages. Uh, hopefully, the education committee today, uh, we will finalize the education curriculum, which will be and a platform that can be uploaded to learning management system. Uh, this is something we could then send out uh, and agencies can uh, assign to your EMCTs. Uh, the other part of this is that we are getting uh, also ready to be able to distribute the naloxone directly to the EMS agencies. And there will be some resource guides that go along with that that's specific to your geographic area. Uh, and we're excited with our partnership with the Center for Rural Health that's helping with that component. So as we get ready to go live, which should be in the next couple of months here, we will make sure there's quite a bit of communication that will go out by a gov delivery to the regional councils, as well as other uh, EMS lists in the state. And we do have the links in the website there if there's any questions. Thank you, Gail. Uh, appreciate the update. Um, and I guess we will also have to make sure we're sharing Sebastian's contact information yes. as well um, for any folks that would like to get in touch with more information as that grant and project moves forward. Um, we have some slides that we wanted to share next. Shelly, if you can help us do the honors. Um, and Ligia, would you like to tag team these updates? Um, I believe that you are probably doing double duty, so I can go ahead and kick off for this meeting. Shelly, can we go to the first slide real quick? In the interest of time, I apologize, this is going to be very brief. We have a new EMS and trauma portal website that is going to be launching here in April. And we wanted to share a bit of a preview with this group and make sure everybody knows the online services that will be available come April. If you go to our homepage at azhealth.gov or azdhs.gov, we actually have a way to search for our EMS website. If you go to the next slide, there is a drop down menu and you can say, I am an emergency medical care technician and it will take you directly to our webpage. If you go to the next slide, our new website um, come April will be launched. We currently have a message on uh, the top of our webpage here that you can see that users should expect downtime with our new portal transition that is coming up. We're expecting to temporarily be offline, potentially between March 31st and April 7th. As soon as the new portal launches in April, we'll make sure that we send out instructions to everyone on the house to log in and access the new system. If you go ahead and go to the next page, we are also mobile friendly. You'll be able to hit our um, new portal from what you can see here with, um, with some screenshots on a mobile device. And on one more click, um, coming soon, the services that are going to be available in the new portal are going to be not just EMCT certification and ground ambulance registration applications. We will also have uh, ground ambulance CON applications, air ambulance licensure applications, um, EMS training program applications and course enrollment trauma and um, base hospital applications, as well as online complaints. Um, again, our new portal, when it does become available online in April, will be as mobile friendly as possible. Um, you can see a screenshot here of some of the new services that will be available in the, in the portal from a desktop. If you go ahead and go to the next page, um, our landing page is going to be modified slightly. When you go and log into our portal currently, um, you'll see um, some of the text that is available here. And then when you go to the next page, we just want to remind folks um, as we get prepared, uh, we will be temporarily offline. And as soon as we do come back up and running, we have some video tutorials and other materials we'll be sharing with all of our users um, to be able to log in and create or claim your account. In the interest of time, Shelly, I don't know if we should actually play this video. It's pretty brief. Um, we can certainly come back to this if there are any questions about the new image trend system that we'll be launching in April. Um, we're really proud of all the work everyone's doing, and it's going to be tremendous to be able to have this launched here in the state. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, do you want to do the rest of your updates? Uh, really quickly, the rest of our updates, we wanted to make sure folks know that the updated national guidelines for field triage training resources are available with a link there, as well as the national 911 report for 2021 data. Um, I'm going to ask Julia if you would like to take it from here for a couple more of the items. Of course. Um, so, I wanted to give a quick update on our EMS and trauma needs assessment. So the Bureau, in partnership with four regional councils, is conducting a 2023 statewide EMS and trauma system needs assessment. Um, the results of this assessment will be used to develop a statewide EMS and trauma system plan and four regional emergency medical services plans. Uh, the assessment will invite responses from two target groups, which is individual, individual EMCTs and then organizations, which will include EMS agencies, hospitals, training centers, and dispatch centers. Um, so exciting news is that beginning today, we are finally able to share the link for the individual EMC survey, um, which we'll, we will be distributing widely. Um, we invite you to participate in the assessment and share with those who may be interested in participating. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I will put my email in the chat as well as the link to the assessment. And today is the first day of launching, so um, we will look forward to um, and then quickly, I will give an update on behalf of Anne. Um, so, regarding the APPR's um, V3.5 update, EMS agency should have a transition plan in place. V3.5 transition should occur prior to July 1st, 2023, which is about three and a half months away. Um, agencies should work with their EPPR vendor on their transition timeline and touch base with the best entities which is building software, APPRs, et cetera, to make sure that everyone is on the same page. All EPCR vendors currently submitting data to APPRs can pass V3.5 for compliance. However, a couple softwares have let their V3.4 compliance last and are no longer in compliance. Um, in those cases especially, please make your transition soon. Um, same as with V3.4, V3.5, EPCR submissions should include all call types and should be submitted within 48 hours of student notified by dispatch date at such time. And uh, please don't have being lost with the gap questions. And I will put the link, uh, oh, I will pass it on to Gail for the next update, and I will put the link um, for the survey in the chat. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight quickly, if, uh, Shelley, if you can go ahead and click on uh, item E. So a big thank you to our education committee uh, who put together this training resource. Uh, for the state, uh, and I think for this committee especially because this does link to training for uh, EMS regarding the field triage guidelines for uh, trauma triage. So I wanted to make sure we highlighted we have an entire section there uh, with the actual training curriculum that can be updated uh, and uploaded to your learning uh, management platform. Uh, we also do have it in a PDF and PowerPoint uh, version as well and instructions in case anyone's having difficulty uploading it to your learning management system. Uh, but really wanted to say great job to the education committee, uh, specifically to Drs. Rice and Dr. Mon, uh, who put together the work in creating this. So I uh, really wanted to include this and make sure we highlighted it, especially for that TEPI committee. Any questions from the trauma centers? Because I think there has been questions about how the field trash for EMS is going to occur moving forward. Any questions in the room? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, and big thank you, Dr. Rice, and to the team that put that together. It's remarkable. Um, I'm not sure who else we still have on the line. Um, do we have Carissa for any trauma registry updates? Yes, um, so we don't really have any major updates from the last uh, meeting we had, but I just wanted to let everyone know we still have Trauma One. Um, and ESO hasn't released their new registry product yet. Um, they aren't anticipating to do so until at least the end of this year, and that won't be for a state product. That'll just be for a hospital based product. Um, and so we'll let you guys know if there are any changes, but we don't foresee getting rid of trauma one at least through this year. So I um, just wanted to keep you guys updated on that. Thank you very much, Carissa. Um, we are fortunate to also have Kim Bohm in the room today. Would you like to share an update on the ATV injury prevention project? Comments, I couldn't remember. Oh, you. Come on over here, Kim. <laughs> um, 
so we've been presented with a really great opportunity to work with Game and Fish, as well as our DQA section to come up with a project kind of based off of our last STAB um, agenda or uh, STAB report, which identified some opportunities for improvements on um, ATV safety, helmets, kids in general. So um, we sat down with them. We had our first meeting. It was um, really great to touch base with them. They already have some programs in place that we may be able to get out more to the community through our trauma centers. So um, we will be meeting with them again with our trauma program managers work group on April 14th to um, discuss where to go next. Very good. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, we look forward to hearing updates on that. Yeah. And it's going to be a great meeting. Um, what was the date again? Uh, April 14th. April 14th, that next trauma program managers work group. In Stafford, Arizona. Very good. Um, and the final thing we have listed to get is another link that we just want to make sure that we put on some agendas through June. ADOT has launched a public comment period for their five-year um, program plan, and they are focusing on updating and widening major corridors. Uh, we feel it's important, especially for um, our EMS and trauma partners, to have an opportunity to review this and provide public comment, particularly as it may impact their communities um, and mobility. And so um, please take a look when you can and um, um, let us know if you have any comments. But the link is there, and Dr. Gaither, we will turn it back to you. Thank you. Any questions, comments, or a wonderful year of staff? <clears throat> um, I have one quick question that I didn't ask at the beginning. Um, Julia, I think this was yours. For that needs assessment, is that something that's going to be sent out via Gov delivery, or is that how? Yeah, so we're hoping to send it out um, with recent blessing through the EMS portal to all of the EMS communities that are in the system, and then we'll also send it out delivery and also um, I'll be sending it out right now to the regional council so that they can send it out through whatever. It'll, it's just an anonymous link so anybody can share the link. Look out for those emails to uh, complete those surveys. And can I? Yes, please. Uh, this needs assessment that's going to be distributed to both individuals and organizations is a really important opportunity for us to identify any workforce needs and other EMS and trauma needs that are out there. We hope that we'll have participation by all EMCPs and by all organizations. It is an opportunity to update our strategic plan, both at the state level and the regional council level, and potentially identify funding needs as well moving forward. So we again really hope that everybody takes the link, shares it, and participates, and um, it will help to inform our, our five-year strategic all right, let's move on then to updates. And, I'm sorry, are there any other questions for the first one? All right, let's move on to updates then. Uh, first, we have the trauma registry user group. Uh, good morning, this is Maria. Um, the two uh, updates that I have from the truck um, group meeting is for state web users, AIS 15 has been implemented in trauma one. And the other thing, uh, we're still waiting for um, NTDB 2023 updates to be completed. Um, those are the only two items I have. All right. Thank you, Maria. You're welcome. Uh, next, next up, trauma program manager workshops. Heather. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, so just like Kim said, they're working on the next trauma program manager workshop for April 14th in Stafford with um, some excellent ATV training that should be coming. Our last meeting was January 27th, held at Banner. Um, they had a great lecture on geriatric trauma, falls, human trafficking, talked about some TQIP data, state reporting, uh, and some injury prevention. So overall, great meeting, and hope to see as many as we can at the next meeting. Excellent. Thank you, Heather. Uh, next up, EMS registry user groups. Raymond? Uh, good morning, everyone. Dr. Gaither. Um, we haven't had, uh, the EMS registry hasn't had a meeting, I believe, since the 22nd of August. I believe there'll be one coming up uh, in the next couple of months. Usually we have one in the middle of the year. So uh, probably by the time we have the next meeting, we'll be able to report something that's uh, new. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's then move on to the discussion and action items. Uh, the first uh, discussion item is to amend uh, sorry, review, amend, and approve the draft meeting minutes from our meeting on November. 
Uh, for those of you in the room, the packet uh, meeting minutes are available to you. And for those of you online, please take a minute to click on the uh, meeting minutes, review those, uh, and we will look for a motion to approve or amend the check. Move to approve this gamer. Candace Williams, second. Thank you, Candace. Uh, any discussion on the approval of the minutes as written? Anything in the chat? No. Okay. Uh, hearing no discussion or chat items, uh, I'd like to call for a vote. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, Aye. Aye. Any, any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none opposed, the uh, uh, motion passed and the minutes are approved without amendment. <clears throat> Let's move on. Did I hear Vossel maybe not available? We want to talk there for a minute. Vossel, do we have you on the line this morning? We'll circle back on B. Let's uh, go then to uh, item C. Uh, do we need fossil for that one too or no? Possibly. Okay. Maybe we'll just go to the share item uh, and we'll come back to those other two. Um, item B is straightforward enough. Um, many of you know we have been uh, blessed as a state to have the statewide cardiac arrest registry uh, that we have used for now. A decade plus to improve survival and cardiac arrest uh, across the state of Arizona. Uh, part of that program sends out annual reports to every partner at EMS agency. Um, and I believe kind of the desire is to really get some feedback into those reports that go out um, and see if we can improve those reports, make them more user friendly to the end users, the EMS agencies and hospitals who provide us data. Um, any other comments on that from the Bureau side? We feel that the SHARE program is incredibly important and we certainly want to see it continue and to be successful. And I think I hear Dr. Bradley coming off mute as well. Dr. Gale, anything to add there? Yes, I think you did summarize it well, but you know, any EMS agency that has been looking at not only their SHARE report, but just any cardiac arrest run on their EPCR, you can see that the information that's collected by the EMS uh, personnel on scene is really important. Uh, it gives us a lot of information regarding on-scene resuscitation, potentially done by uh, family, law enforcement, bystanders, care facilities. Uh, in order for us to kind of improve outcomes in cardiac arrest, that data is really vital. So I think this is a great opportunity for us to look at what data is collected uh, initially on scene, uh, by the actual crew that runs on that cardiac arrest, and then how that data intersects with the hospital. So uh, looking forward to this group forming and seeing what input we can get. I think what we're looking for from this group is do you favor this, the formation of essentially a user's group, very similar to those updates we got from above, uh, to really guide and direct the share reporting process um, and help improve those reports so that they're user friendly. Um, happy to consider a motion uh, for this or discuss for Move to form such a group. This is Gamer. Dr. Gamer. Ms. Flanagan will second. I'm sorry, I missed the name. Say that one more time. Uh, Tom Flanagan. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so with a motion on the floor to form a share user group, um, any discussion on that topic? Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll start, uh, uh, Dr. Gaither. Um, so the, would this be sort of under the auspices of the current share, uh, share uh, entity? Um, uh, including the personnel, and would they be calling the meetings that uh, they would, uh, uh, sorry, um, calling the meetings that we would need to uh, have and sort of setting a meeting schedule? And 
who do you envision uh, chairing such a uh, user group? Great question, Dr. Gamer. Uh, as Shelly just wrote next to me, please uh, ask for volunteers. <laughs> that, this is important, actually, to give some history on. As many of you know, um, the University of Arizona has, for the last decade, partnered with the DHS to uh, really do the science side of SHARE, um, to ask questions and do some publications off of that. Uh, I know many of the current SHARE staff members who do the work of data entry, unless they're on the call, uh, but would love to participate in this work group um, and would be happy to kind of take leadership roles in that work group to call the meetings, to um, generate drafts, to help review those drafts. Uh, I think what we're really looking for from this work group is the end users, uh, people like you, Dr. Gamer, who see these reports once a year and then look to implement changes at your EMS agency based on those reports. I think what the group really needs is feedback from individuals like you. Uh, is this useful, not useful? What would you like to see that type of information? Does that help uh, with the question? Absolutely. Yeah, Thank volunteers. you, Dr. Gaither. Three volunteers. Uh, Dr. Gamer, um, Allison, and Tom. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Um, before we get to volunteers, um, I would like to uh, if, offer any other questions, comments on the motion on the floor, which is to form the work group. Dr. Bradley? Dr. Bradley, did you have a comment or question? I took my hand down, but did not unmute myself. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hopefully that will be my one un uh, unmute for the day. Uh, what I was just mentioning, since the Bureau is uh, organizing this meeting under TEPI, uh, we will be the ones kind of organizing, scheduling the meeting, uh, but definitely we'll be utilizing the expertise of the current uh, SHARE staff at U of A uh, to help facilitate this. So it would be kind of a combined uh, joint endeavor, just like all the SHARE program is, uh, but uh, we would be the ones organizing and scheduling that since it is scheduled under TEPI. Dr. Bradley. Any other comments, questions? Dr. Gaither, I'd like to call a question on the uh, motion on the floor to form the uh, committee or the okay. user group, excuse me. I'm happy to call for a vote. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, all those, any opposed, please say nay. All right, hearing none opposed and all in favor, the motion passed. Can I then uh, turn to volunteers to um, participate in this work group? We have three online. Yes. We have Tom Flanagan. Perfect. Allison Welch. Allison Amber. Matt. In the room, sorry. Uh, Eric Cooper. Okay. Phil Guadnola is typing yes. Okay. Well, I was just going to nominate uh, Dr. Rice to uh, chair that if she is interested, based on her work with the arrest program and her participation in share over the years. All right, good. Uh, thank you. I think we've accomplished that uh, motion. Uh, let's move on then. Yeah. Back. All right, let's go back to item B, uh, annual EMS report from Bothell. Good morning, everyone. Um, Shelly, do you want me to present through my screen or would you like to open up the annual report? Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then have you present your All screen. right, perfect. Um, okay.
Oh, I am sorry, guys. I'm trying to figure it out the screen. I don't have the monitors today. Can you guys see this? You want me just to display something that's posted to the website? Also, we're unable to see your screen. Um, would you like Shelly to post up the annual report so folks can view it from our side? Yes, please, uh, Rachel. I don't have. Yeah, I don't have monitors today, and hence I'm I'm not sure how do I present this with. It pulled up, and um, just by way of introduction, uh, for anybody that's newer, especially some of our um, newest team members that are joining us today, Vossel is the ultimate EMS and trauma data guru. Um, she has done tremendous things to look at the trends over time in our EMS and trauma databases. Um, she has moved us also from static PDF reports to dynamic online dashboards. And we're very excited to be able to highlight both with you today. And uh, Russell, I think we have it up now. Can you see Shelly's screen? All right. Perfect, Shelly. Thank you, Shelly. <clears throat> what page we start? Shelly, we can go to the snapshot of the 2022 annual report. I can present the snapshot and then talk a little bit about the details inside the report. Yeah. All right. So as we can see in the snapshot, we had now. Uh -oh. So close. <laughs> so close. are you with us? Would you like uh, Mayor Gail to step in while we wait for her to come back? Yeah, we'll need to. Re okay. Um, Vasil, if you can hear us, we cannot hear you. And I can go ahead and just hit a few of the high notes while we wait for your audio or connectivity to come back. Um, so what we're seeing here is the Arizona EMS system snapshot. It includes over 1 million um, 1 million incidents that were reported to AZ peers during the year of 2021. So keep in mind, we are always looking at historical data when we look at these snapshots. It takes some time to get all the reports in, get the data cleaned, et cetera. Um, here we see, again, I think it's just over 1 million that we're able to include in the actual analysis. That is over 3,000 incidents reported per day. We break them down by ground and air. And you all know we have um, a much different volume when we look at it that way. Uh, we also break them down by 911 and inner facility, with the majority of the incidents being reported to AZ Peers as 911, but we also collect inner facility transport information from all of our participating agencies. There are almost 180 agencies Statewide, both air and ground, that submit data to AZ Peers. I think you heard from Ann's update. We get this information usually within one day of the incident, but it's almost always within 48 hours that data is reported to us. It's very close to real time. And um, we're fortunate that we have, it sounds like most providers on board with going to that new that NEMSIS version 3.5 update. Uh, Vassal, are you back with us? Yes, I think. Can you guys hear me now? Vasil, we can hear you now. Um, I started talking through the snapshot, and I don't know if you would like to take us through prevalence and some of our um, top um, our top um, impression categories of interest and mortality trends. Sure. So as we can see in the top uh, five prevalence, our injury is on a uh, respiratory distress, seizures, psychiatric disorder, suicide, and substance abuse. These are actually not the top five, but these are the primary areas of interest. Let me put it that way. Uh, that is, it's just not the top five of it. There are thousands of primary impressions in EMS. So it is very hard to uh, figure this out. So these are the primary areas of interest where the Bureau has shown interest that, okay, we need to figure it out what's going on in this area. And those are the five impressions we take into account. So that is for the pediatric. As we can see, the pedi pedi top five, we have pediatric and adult below. We uh, we have all 
everybody, not just adult. So that's injury, substance abuse, psychiatric disorders, seizures, and cardiac arrest. Whereas in the pediatric, we have resp We do not have the cardiac arrest as one of the primary impressions of interest in that. Followed by, we do have, the, we, we talk about the median time intervals for 911 EMS ground incidents and uh, response time is eight minutes, scene time is 12 minutes and transport time is 11 minutes. Um, it, the report does talk about these response times in detail, uh, like, you know, those patients who were transported to the hospitals and then what was the scene time and what was the transport times by region and everything. Uh, but this is in general, the statewide, it gives you an information on, and on average, any 911 EMS ground incident, the response time is eight minutes. Um, when we look at the mortality by the primary and secondary impression categories, uh, cardiac arrest definitely has the highest mortality. We see 85.9% is a mortality. Opioid, 13%. Uh, STEMI, 8%. Stroke, 5 And diabetes has 2.5% uh, mortality. So when we look at the, the, the snapshot, uh, provides basically what is in detail later on the report talks about so in the report uh, i'm not going to go through the uh, everything in the report but what you would see in the report is that it's divided into few sections it starts with on uh, 911 ground ems incidents and then it will describe the picture of um, all the 911 ground uh, incidents like their age uh, gender county what were the primary impressions among them and the regional distribution followed by it talks about the interfacility transfers and the same thing if it is an interfacility transfer what's going on in that area um, we also have a section which talks about um, ems when we when all the patients those patients were transported to the hospital we link those patients to the hospital discharge database. And then we talk about like, OK, once they are linked with the hospital discharge, when what was their outcome at the hospitals? So this way, this report also describes what is the on-scene mortality and for what was the in-hospital mortality. Um, and then the last, last thing is on the uh, response times and transport times and scene time. If if there are any other questions on the report, you know. So it would it be possible to page through the report so that um, we can take a brief look at that? Okay. Um, Shelly, would you mind repeating the questions? I can't hear it. Oh, I'm sorry, Vasa. I asked to page through the report so that we could briefly glance at the other pages of the report uh, that uh, Shelly's sharing with us. OK, sure. I can go uh, briefly go through the report. I just didn't know the time constraint, how much we have. So so as yeah, that describes basically the uh, 911 EMS incidents by month and the day, hour of the day. And as we can see, the peak hours are between the, the regular peak hours. And then it, yep. Then the, by age, the, that is an age uh, percent, and then there's an age uh, EMS incidence rate per 100,000. So as the age increases, the number of EMS incidents increases. And the gender, there is not much difference between the two populations, male and female. It's kind of similar. And then age and gender distributions. And again, it's showing the same thing is that as you know, among the elderly, if we see that the you will see more of a female incidence percent is higher compared to the male, whereas in the younger population, the male percent is higher compared to the female. And then the county-wise, um, La Paz has the highest EMS incident rates per hundred thousand compared to other counties. And urban and rural, again, the rural has more significantly higher, like 16,000 per 100,000 compared to 10,000 in urban, the EMS incident rate. And that has been true for Arizona. You know, we always had a rural higher rate of EMS incidents or trauma 
compared to urban. And yeah. that's the regional distributions. And so any region, region wise also, we can see the age and uh, uh, gender distributions through the region. So that 911 EMS incidents by region. OK, this is where we talk about the hospital discharge database. So those patients who were treated and transported as a disposition uh, from the EMS side, uh, uh, I link those, I link that patients to the hospital discharge database. So total, there were treated and transported 6,000, 670,000 6, patients, and th those were linked to the hospital discharge database. Shelly, if you scroll, I can show the little bit scroll down. There is a number over here. Yeah, right there. So we were able to link 90% of those patients. So 600,000 patients were linked out of 70,000 to the hospital discharge database. And what we see in those patients is we had in hospital mortality 1.2% uh, ED. And uh, if they were admitted as inpatient, 6.98% mortality. And so that disposition, like, you know, what happened at the ED or if they were admitted, what happened after admissions is shown in that table. Then the section is followed by uh, after 911 EMS incidents. Now we talk about the interfacility transports. And as you can see, we have 80,000 interfacility transports in 20, 2021. And then it's by month, the transports. And then the, what is the age specific? Yeah. And over here, if we say the interfacility transport ports, what we saw in 911 EMS incidents that there were elderly, you know, especially greater than 85 years old, there were a very high uh, percent of EMS incidents happening in that population. So what we are seeing in the interfacility transports, it's mainly it's the middle age group. If we see from 25 to um it increases after age of 25 and peaks at the age of 55 and 65 years old are you having the highest proportion of interfacility transports. By county, Navajo is, oops, yeah, Navajo has the highest and followed by this Apache and La Paz County, whereas in 911, La Paz was highest. Urban and rural, again, uh, we see the same pattern similar to 911 uh, EMS ground incidents is that rural is higher compared to the urban. <laughs> and then the cities, and that makes sense, you know, the patients more from the rural area requires interfacility transports because you see that that's 2,300 to 781. So the difference is quite a bit between rural and urban, which was expected. And Basil, may I yes. just add on here um, mm -hmm. for context? Again, we're looking at 2021 data in this report. That is during the time frame that we also had the Arizona surge line activated, and the surge line was responsible for facilitating transfers from lower levels of care to higher levels of care. During that time, we saw a significant increase in interfacility transport, particularly from rural to urban areas. And um, just keep in mind when you're looking at this 2021 data, that was in effect. I'll go back to you. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. OK, let's talk about the mortality. Now, this page talks about in hospital and on scene mortality both. As we knew, uh, we know from uh, from that first page, I told you that 1.1 million records were included in this analysis. So out of 1.1 million records, 36,554 is the number of deaths. And of those 36,554, there were some were on scene and some were in hospitals, and that's the distributions over here by the age. And obviously, as age increases, the mortality percent are increasing. We can go down. So on scene mortality twelve thousand, and in hospital is twenty four thousand, uh, almost twenty five thousand mortality. All right. Um... Yeah, and then this is about the primary and secondary impression categories of interest. <clears throat> so in that in primary categories of interest, what you saw in the snapshot was just the five of those, but that this table talks about many more. <clears throat> um, 
this time this year we added the figure 18 which was not there last year the figure 18 um shall just one one second i just want to highlight is that injury is 14 percent of ems incidents were injury related and so i wanted to basically go into depth of injury to figure it out what kind of injury so figure 18 uh it talks about the types of injury and if we see the fall uh, which is like kind of what 43 percent of all the injury incidents now this EMS side also reflects the same story we have been seeing in our trauma um, report that fall is a number one mechanism of injury and it gets basically confirmed over here even on the EMS side. Um, so if we just want to keep rolling as Vossel's um, no longer connected, um, key time intervals is the next page. Um, here you can see um, the information we have on response time for 911 incidents. Vossel, are you back? Yeah, sorry guys for poor connection. I'm not at home. I'm in Seattle and facing some network issues. <clears throat> yes. Um, Shelly, can we go on the table one, the above one? Yes. So as we can see over here, these are the median response time for the 911 EMS incidents, ground incidents, which are around 900,000. <clears> the report response time was missing only in 0.3 percent so that's a very good quality data all right let's go ahead and in the interest of time um would you be okay scrolling quickly through these i think um <clears throat> many of these are self-explanatory but yeah um yeah, this is really just a testament to so many of the providers, almost 180 that submitted data during this time period. The data is very good. It gets better every year. Um, we hope by going to Nemesis 3.5 this summer that it continues to get better and it allows us to track trends, much like we started the conversation about cardiac arrest. Um, it, it helps us to track trends and look at outcomes and system improvements both statewide and nationally when we improve our data quality to this effect. So uh, this is a huge testament to 180 agencies that reported data during this time frame. Um, it's incredible to be able to look at the information this way. If Bosco was still on the line, we would just ask her if she had anything to say about the dynamic dashboards that are available on our website. Um, about the EMS annual report, right, Rachel? Bustle, in the interest of time, because we do have, I think, at least one more agenda item, if not two, to get to, uh, would you be able to help us plug the 911 dashboard that is now online for folks that are interested in looking at some of the dynamic data we have available now? Sure. Sh Shelly, would you mind uh, projecting that, or you just want me to talk? I think if you go on our website, we'll, it's a... Yeah, we'll pull it up. Well, um, if you want to give a quick plug about what it is, Bustle, that'd be awesome. Correct. So the this current dashboard, what we have, it talks about just a week old data and also gives us the volume of two days before. Um, I So it, it talks about like, OK, two days before here, call, call volume last week and then call volume on March 14th. So it's uh, as live as we possible. You know, we have done this because we have we have given EMS agencies kind of an a one day or 24 hours, you know, to send us the data. But and then just adding one more extra day so as two days is like okay you know it's the best timeline for me to uh, make it as uh you know the live of uh, data available so 2421 call volume on march 14 got entered into az peers and then the, that's the last week volume and then the last week call volume by all of these five primary impressions of interest 
And that tells us, like, OK, we had 357 cardiac arrest calls in the state, 82 STEMI, and the stroke. And then as we see, the fall is, again, the number one, which is 1,400 calls for on falls. And the motor vehicle crashes is around 628. If we go on the top, Shelley, and click on that lap, um, weekly averages, and if people see that, then they want to compare, OK, I understand that, OK, I had this many call, uh, cardiac arrest call last week. Is I, Am I higher or lower than average? So that's where you they, you know, you know can click and go back uh, to see what was the weekly average for each of these primary impressions for the last few years. Um, so yeah, that's about that dashboard. Amazing work, Lasso. Yep, absolutely amazing. Um, <clears throat> any discussion on this agenda item? I think this is for information and discussion only. So, thoughts, comments? Again, <clears throat> fabulous work. All right. Any comments in the chat? No. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move on then to the next item, which is to discuss the current uh, trauma registry public data set age groups. On this one, I'm going to need some help. Yeah, Bob. <clears throat> well, um, I can speak to this if if it's better. Yeah, Carissa, do that. Thank okay. you. Yeah. So what this is is um, whenever someone requests a data um, that has a submit a data request that's one of our pub our public data sets, um, we divide up the data by age group. We don't give out the exact date of birth, um, and so currently that data is divided up. Um, and I'll go ahead and share in the chat just so you can see real quick. But it's basically 0 to 14 and then 15 on in sets of 10. Um, and so we wanted to know if it was best for you guys, if it's 0 to 14 or 0 to 15. Um, that's probably the only age group just for peds and that kind of thing that will make a difference. Um, if if you guys are good with zero to 14 and then 15 to 24 and then the groups of 10 onward um it only affects like i said it this is for the public data set so it's um just when people submit those requests so if it works as is that's great but if you'd rather have it zero to 15 or zero to 18 whatever um we can change those groups and that'll change how the data is broken up when you receive it after submitting a data request Thank you for that brief overview uh, comments. Um, I have some research opinions, but I'll share, share those for a minute. Carissa, can you keep the age groups uh, you know, for, uh, projected over here so people can see it for the comments? Um, I can share. Yeah, I put them in the comments. OK. Yeah, can everyone see those? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'll, I'll give you my thoughts on this. As a, as a researcher, I use the public data set uh, frequently to develop questions. Um, we frequently need the 14 to 18 and 18 to 21 year old groups. Um, those are different um, from a 21 to 24 year old. Um, frequently, we're asked for the number of 18 year olds and less, and the number of 21 year olds and less. Um, so I don't know if that's something possible to add in here. It would be very helpful. Uh, for the few of us that use these data sets for question generation. Right. And I agree with that. You, the re requests we have received in the past, you know, sometimes they want to look at the pediatric uh, age. And if we have somewhere, uh, and pediatric age is defined 0 to 14 or less than 18, depending upon the researcher's question. So if we have those age groups, then it would be easy for them to get the pediatric out. Any other comments, questions? All right. Uh, I don't believe this is a voting item, so we'll move on to the next item. Uh, the final item we have to consider is to discuss, amend, and approve forming a work group to approve the bylaws. I'm sorry, review the bylaws. I believe it's standard time. This is not, uh, there's no indication. This is simply something uh, that we need to get done as a regular review. Um, can I have a motion to consider this item? Motion. Thank you. Sorry. All right. Oh, Barb, yeah. Shall we or shall we back? <clears throat> Any second? Heather Miller, second.
Thank you, Heather. We have a first from Barb and a second from Heather. That's great. All right. Uh, this item is open for discussion. Any comments, questions, concerns before we call a vote? All right. Hearing none, uh, all those in favor of forming a work group to review the bylaws, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. All those, uh, sorry, any who, who wish to abstain, I forgot on the last one. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hearing none, uh, the motion passes. The next item will need to be to identify participants or volunteers to uh, partake in the review of the bylaws. I'm happy to do that. Such a juicy topic. I know, everybody's <laughs> excited to review bylaws. I may be the only member of this work group. <laughs> Bar. It's going to be very brief. Yeah, I'm happy to bully, uh, we'll bully our in person. <clears throat> All right, if you'd like to participate in this work, or please, please do reach out to Shelly uh, either during or after the meeting, um, and we will uh, get a work group together to do this. It will probably be done in one meeting, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be very quick. They'll help me understand. That's right. That's yeah. exactly. Uh, perfect. Uh, thank you all. Uh, next is a call for agenda items for the next meeting. Uh, we'll take any of those now, or you can send them to Shelly offline if you'd like to do that. Hearing none, um, let's look at the call to the public. Anyone have a public announcement? Items for a call to the public. Okay, last on the agenda, upcoming events. There are a lot. You can tell we no longer have COVID restrictions. If you want to participate in some education, you have almost a weekly offering here on the schedule coming up for the next quarter. Uh, all kinds of great things. Take a look at those. It looks like we have some good links. And as always, I think these are also available on the Bureau website. With that, I will adjourn the meeting. Our next meeting is July 20th in the same location, sorry, likely in the same location, uh, at 9 a.m. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah.